certainly wouldn't put it in gear. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my personal pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event on diplomacy in Iraq. I'm delighted to host my very distinguished colleagues uh, from the United States Foreign Service, uh, John Negroponte, Ryan Crocker, and Ronald Newman, who are at the panel table. All have had distinguished careers, as you can see from your program notes and the bios, and rose to the highest ranks, including ambassador. So I'm obliged to call them the honorable, even though I have to smirk at that title for myself and my colleagues since we know each other too well. But I'm going to just <laughs> leave it at that. The Baker Institute has played its modest role in advising the U.S. government on Iraq policy. Uh, prior to the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Baker Institute and the Council of Foreign Relations published a report entitled Guiding Principles for U.S. Post-Conflict Policy in Iraq. And in 2006, as many of you know, Secretary James A. Baker III and Congressman Lee Hamilton chaired the Bipartisan Iraq Study Group, which I had the privilege of serving as a senior policy advisor. Those of us on the outside did our best to advise senior policymakers on the way forward. But the greatest challenge lay in the hands of tonight's panelists. Each one of them has played an important, even key, role in the formulation and execution of U.S. foreign policy toward Iraq. Our panelists tonight will discuss the ways in which the United States and its allies can <clears throat> continue to help stabilize Iraq as a unified state at peace with itself and its neighbors, and address Iraq's political, sectarian, and tribal differences through democratic means, hopefully. And they will also consider the past, present, and future of U.S. diplomacy toward Iraq and the region. There's a great deal of expertise at this table tonight. And so with these considerations in mind, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. John Negroponte entered the United States Diplomatic Service in 1960. He has served in many senior positions in the United States government. I was telling John early he has so many titles, but I can't tell you the off-color joke I told him, but he has had so many titles that I can't go through all of them. But including the first Director of National Intelligence, Deputy Secretary of State, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and the first U.S. Ambassador to Iraq in the post-Saddam uh, era. Today, he is a research fellow and lecturer at Yale University's Macmillan Center for International Studies. He is a recipient of the prestigious George F. Kennan Award for Public Service. Ryan Crocker is a career ambassador <coughs> in the United States Foreign Service. Ryan was the United States Ambassador to Iraq from 2007 until 2009, a very critical period. Uh, he and General Petraeus uh, became truly media stars, and I'm sure you saw them on C-SPAN on television doing those critical hearings uh, on Iraq, and Ryan obviously played a very critical role in all of that. Previously, he served as the U.S. Ambassador to Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. Ryan has been honored with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian award, numerous other awards and decorations for public service, and he's going to have to leave us immediately, he just told me, uh, because tomorrow the first recipient of an award at the State Department is going to be presented by Secretary Clinton in honor of Ryan Crocker for excellence in expeditionary diplomacy. <laughs> so that's, I got that right, that's pretty good. <clears throat> I've got to tell you a story about Ryan. I'll be very brief, but when I was Assistant Secretary of State for NEA, he was obviously one of the brightest and the best, a rising star, and I would say, Ryan, you've got to accept an assignment in Washington. You are our Lawrence of Arabia. You seek out every challenging post in the field, but you're never going to make it to the top if you don't have a Washington assignment. <laughs> so I finally nabbed him to become a deputy when I was there, and six months later, I needed to send someone to ambassador on a uh, to Afghanistan on a volunteer basis. And guess who was front and center of my desk? <laughs> so he foiled me at every opportunity to serve abroad. He hated Washington. He hated the bureaucracy. I don't blame him. <laughs> Our moderator this evening is uh, Ron Ronald Newman, president of the American Academy of Diplomacy and a former United States ambassador to Afghanistan, Algeria, and Bahrain. Ron also served as United States political advisor in Iraq. He's one of our outstanding experts in the region. 
uh, you can see that these are men who have not shirked difficult and challenging and even dangerous posts. We are delighted to have the American Academy of Diplomacy co-sponsor this panel discussion under the Joseph J. Sisko Memorial Forum, named in honor of the former Under Secretary of State, who was one of my mentors when I was a young diplomat in the State Department. The forum aims to stimulate public discussion on the foreign policy themes to which Under Secretary Sisko dedicated his illustrious career. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel, and I'm going to turn it over to Ron Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, very much. Thank you to the Baker Center. Very pleased to be here. I also want to express a particular thanks to the Cisco family, Carol Cisco in particular. They have uh, helped the Academy in sponsoring a yearly event uh, on the discussion of diplomacy. Carol Cisco wanted very much to be here, but uh, she's had a broken ankle and her doctor forbade her to fly at the last minute. But I do have a few words from her. Uh, that she, that I wanted to tell you about. Uh, she said, when my dad was assistant secretary for NEA, he had a wonderful group of young foreign service officers, Ed Dirigian, Pete Martinez, Arnie Rafel, and White House fellow Judy Walters. My sister Jane and I were teenagers at the time and loved to go down to dad's office to be around these people. Unbeknownst to them, we referred to them as the Mod Squad, a popular TV show of the area, because they reminded us of the show's young group of hip political officers. It was our first inkling that being a Foreign Service officer could be cool and fun. In all seriousness, my father was very proud of Ed, Peter, Arnie, and Judy. It was a very sad day when all of our family went to Andrews on Arnie's return to the States after his death while serving as ambassador in Pakistan. My father continued to check in with Ed, Peter, and Judy until his death. Dad would be pleased that Ed has facilitated the Cisco Forum's presence at the Baker Institute. I know he would also applaud his colleagues in the Academy for their continued efforts to promote diplomacy in this country. I am convinced that my father's enthusiasm and passion for diplomacy is embodied in this event. And she gave me authority not to use that, but I thought it was well worth reading. And Ed, double, double thanks. The Academy of Diplomacy is a little-known institute, although Ed knew about us, so he was, in fact, he's one of us, so that he was very uh, helpful in putting this event together with us. It is a small group of uh, former senior practitioners in diplomacy. Its primary function is to explain and strengthen American diplomacy. And uh, a brief moment of commercial interruption here. Uh, in last year, we sat down to do a big study of how many people, state, and aid actually need, our conclusion being that our diplomatic instruments were essentially broken and that we were facing increasing problems in implementing policy, no matter whose policy it was. The result of that was this study that some of you may have picked up outside. Uh, it turned out to be the first time that anybody had sat down to actually say, what resources do you need? to carry out the missions you're given, something that you would have thought was basic, military does it regularly. We found this was the first time it had been done, as far as we could find out, in the post-war period. Uh, that may tell you something about the nation's approach to diplomacy. In any event, our, uh, one of our two founding principles is to try to explain what diplomacy is actually all about. Americans are always talking about it, but it's not always clear that they know what it means. The military is increasingly talking about it, but that often seems to amount to, could I have a pound of diplomacy and six ounces of negotiation, and would you please produce the agreement by Tuesday? Uh, on the subject of tonight on Iraq, there has been an enormous amount written about how we got into the Iraq, what we didn't do, uh, the military operations. And there's often a subtext of we need to do this, that, or the other thing in the security field in order to promote political goals, at which point everybody reverts to talking about military operations. And there has been extraordinarily little commentary on what it actually means to do diplomacy in Iraq. How do you, in fact, get something accomplished? How do you use the tools, the levers, of diplomacy to 
in fact produce the results which one is being asked to do. And so we thought it would be interesting tonight to look at that subject in more detail, to talk about what the problems were and what the limitations were on diplomacy. And the academics, uh, as somebody famously remarked, tend to write to a conclusion and diplomats have to think to action. And the question of how you produce action is one that I think deserves a great deal more study than it's had. And so it's a great pleasure for me tonight uh, to be with my colleagues. I served under John Negroponte in Baghdad. Uh, Ryan and I have been in, revolving around each other in more strange places than I can remember going back to Iran in the pre-revolutionary days where we first knew each other. And so we wanted to investigate these subjects. And without more ado than I want to turn it over to them to talk about the issues they faced, how they dealt with some of them, and a look forward. And John, why don't you go ahead and start? You have, you, are you, you have time? Or are you gonna, gonna oh, okay. I got the feeling that you might have to leave in, in the middle of this. I just thought it would be more sensible to start that chronologically. You know, chronologically. No, absolutely. Set the stage. Well, good. first, uh, thank you, Ed, for hosting this event, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us this evening. And it's great to see uh, Ryan uh, and Ron again. Uh, believe it or not, we don't see each other that often now that we've all uh, retired uh, from the service. But we certainly have had the opportunity to work on uh, on the Iraq issue together, uh, among others. And uh, not only uh, was I in Iraq as ambassador, but then when I was Deputy Secretary of State, Ryan was uh, the ambassador, and we were following very carefully the great work he was doing on negotiating the status of forces uh, agreement with, with Iraq, which really kind of created a framework for the way forward in our relationship. Uh, with that country, so he was there at an absolutely critical time in, in more ways than one. I also had the opportunity to work on Iraq before the war began because I was our ambassador to uh, the United Nations. And uh, in the fall of, of 2002, uh, an effort uh, was made at the United Nations to uh, try to find a negotiated and a diplomatic uh, way to avoid uh, war with Iraq, and we negotiated a resolution with which I had a, quite a bit to do, uh, with Resolution 1441, which reinstated a whole inspection regime uh, for weapons of mass de destruction in Iraq. And that was uh, concluded. We all thought it was a pretty significant uh, accomplishment. Uh, regrettably, um, and, and, and this is by way of editorializing now on the policy, we really didn't give that policy time to work. I think that the die had already been cast. The, when you read all the material that's come out since that time, you know that the decision had been pretty much made to go to war. And uh, the UN effort was sort of a fig leaf. And uh, in, in my opinion, that's sort of regrettable because, and I know we're, this wasn't exactly the topic of our discussion, but I, but I think, think if there was one major error with respect to the uh, Iraq policy, I would put it this way. We acted, rightly or wrongly, without the sanction of the international community. And if you look back at the various other instances where we've taken actions of this kind, legitimation by others in the international community has always been extremely important. And if you look at the premier example, after all, the institute, uh, the person for whom this institute is named, the effort in the first Gulf War in 1990 was an exemplary piece of diplomacy by an absolutely superb Secretary of State who went and personally ensured that we got a unanimous vote of the Security Council for our effort in the Gulf in response to Saddam's invasion. And it's not that we necessarily expect burden sharing from the international community in these situations, but we want the legitimacy that is provided 
uh, by having a Security Council resolution or having all the Europeans and the NATO countries uh, on board with us in what we do. So I, I would say, you know, that was probably the most significant problem with our unilateral move uh, into, into Iraq. But in any event, uh, just quickly on, on the situation I faced when I got in Iraq, I presided over the transition, if you will, from a coalition provisional authority, which was an occupation government led by Ambassador Bremer, to the an ambassador to the country of Iraq, the government of Iraq, uh, where it again resumed the exercise of its own uh, sovereignty. I mean, the situation was extraordinary. Uh, the government had no way of extending its writ uh, beyond the offices it occupied in Baghdad. There was one battalion in the entire Iraqi army. Uh, there was practically no police force. Um, the economy was in, in a shambles. And the, my predecessors had focused on the reconstruction, quote unquote, of Iraq at a time when actually there was an incipient insurgency that was intensifying. And so I, in my view, we expended a lot of resources in the name of reconstruction to basically uh, uh, repair damage that was being done by this growing insurgency. It was sort of like being on a treadmill. Probably the most, uh, uh, most graphic example that I can recall of that was that it was a General Molin, and he was uh, Australian, and he was in charge of a little group in uh, the uh, military staff there whose sole job was to basically uh, go out and repair electric towers that had been destroyed the night before, uh, which were blown up with, with regularity by the insurgents, and then we just had to build them back up. And of course, we were expending very valuable uh, reconstruction monies to accomplish that. So what I found was that security really was the principal problem that we faced. I presented Washington with a proposal to reprogram resources from our reconstruction budget to uh, uh, devote more of those resources to uh, training and capacitating the uh, Iraqi army and police force. And uh, in fact, David Petraeus, who's now the commander of the Central Command and was the commander in Iraq uh, subsequently, but at that time he was, the, he was made the head of our training effort for the Iraq security forces, so he was a member of my embassy team. The other uh, uh, two issues uh, that we confronted, one very much related to security, which is the growing uh, strength of al-Qaeda and the fact that they established sort of a stronghold, particularly in Fallujah, but, but throughout the Sunni Triangle. You know the story, and Fallujah became basically a, a sort of a, a haven for um, uh, Zarqawi and, 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 and his ilk. We made one effort in the spring of uh, 2004 to go in there. That's before, uh, that was during the coalition provisional authority. It wasn't uh, successful, but we did finally go in in November of 2004 and cleaned that place up. And I, I think it, it had to be uh, if, uh, if we were going to be able to carry forward in Iraq because it was just an intolerable situation where a major town like that was being controlled by, uh, uh, by the Al Qaeda. Uh, we also, at the, during my time, had um, a, a Shia extremist kind of rebellion going on in several of the Iraqi cities, and that eventually was also put down. It happened in Sadr City and Najaf and elsewhere, and it was put down sufficiently that uh, it, the, the leader of that movement, or at least many of his followers, uh, really opted more to follow the political rather than uh, process rather than a path of violence. And uh, we succeeded by the shortly before I left in January of 2005 in having the elections for a new National Assembly uh, from which a new government uh, was formed. Uh, and uh, you all remember the people holding up their fingers with the indelible ink on it. And it was, it was quite a, a satisfying moment when that happened. And it was, a, it was I would say, a diplomatic and political success, which we had a lot to do with. Our embassy worked a lot with both the government and the United Nations in helping organize those elections. And I think, I think we brought some good background and experience 
uh, to bear on the situation. If there was a failing, it was that we couldn't persuade some of the Sunni elements in the country to uh, participate in that election. And some of you may recall that the Sunni, uh, uh, many Sunni boycotted the election. But I frankly think that that was not so much a political act uh, on their part as simply one of fear. They, uh, they came from the least secure part of the country and uh, a lot of them feared to participate in the election for fear for their lives. They subsequently, uh, as things improved in the country, they did choose to be more uh, involved in, in, in the political process. So we got, we, we got started on restoring security. We got started on the political process. But by the time I left in March of 2005, I, I'd say we were, uh, we were not really uh, that far along at all. Uh, and uh, there were still uh, and in fact, I sent a report, a long sort of end of tour report to the president, the secretary of state, and I put in it my judgment that it would take another five years from January or so of 2005 uh, to stabilize Iraq. Now, nobody in Washington wanted to hear a five year forecast. I mean, that was just, uh, I mean, it, frankly, it was dismissed out of hand. I, I, I think it's turned out to be more or less correct, uh, if in fact it is correct. I mean, that's one of the big questions uh, going forward, and maybe we can discuss that a bit during uh, the question uh, and answer period. But I guess if, in terms of lessons learned, I, I, I would like to leave you with two thoughts or make, make two points for sure. One is, and I've served in Vietnam, I've served in Central America, um, served in Iraq to help deal with Afghanistan, and that is that if we as a nation decide to get involved in these types of wars, conflicts, we've got to understand that they invariably take more time and uh, involve more resources and time than uh, we ever anticipate to start with, or at least our, our leaders anticipate. That'd be my first point. And uh, the second is that uh, as in Vietnam, in Iraq, and in, I think in Afghanistan too, we, we tend to not, because we think things are going to be accomplished more quickly than they actually, actually turns out to be the case, we don't put enough effort into capacity building of the local security forces, be it police or uh, the military, uh, and, and then after that, uh, the, uh, the other civic institutions. But, but, but nation building is important if you're going to get involved in these things. And of course, there was a kind of a mental block about nation building in the first Bush term. I think it, it, it mellowed substantially during the second, and we sort of got on a, a bit more onto it. And that leads perhaps to my final point, which is in terms of our own capacity to deal with those kinds of issues as a government and as a diplomatic establishment, I think we've let a lot of our nation building kind of assets in, on the civilian side atrophy in the last several decades. I mean, when I served in Vietnam, we had thousands, I think it was five or 10,000 people from AID administering our assistance programs. Uh, throughout that country. AID is a shadow of its former self. It's only got about 1,000 officers as opposed to about 10,000 during the height of the Vietnam War. And our assistance efforts have been uh, fragmented so that we have uh, different bureaus and different bureaucratic entities handling many different parts of our assistance efforts. So you have a Bureau of Refugee Affairs that handles refugees. You have a Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement that handles that part. You have a Millennium Challenge account that has a completely separate affair of its own. And so we have no way of, of really coordinating and concentrating our assistance efforts to achieve important national purposes. And I, I really think if we're going to get it right in the future, that that is an issue that is going to have to be looked at much more seriously than it has been looked at to date back in Washington. Meanwhile, diplomats, ambassadors in particular, sit astride all of this when they're in the field. I, I cannot overstate the critical role that an ambassador can play, 
in helping manage these situations because ambassadors are, they have a letter from the president saying they are in charge of the entire civilian effort in that country. And in, in Iraq, we were confronted with this very unique opportunity of working side by side with a military commander to <coughs> achieve, uh, to work towards our objectives. And so our relationship with our military counterparts became an extremely important fact indeed, factor. Thank you. Let you, let you go right ahead, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, well, thanks. Uh, and thanks to Ambassador Jerigian and the Baker Institute for, for convening this forum. Uh, it's, it's good to be back here. I, I um, had a previous visit uh, just about a decade ago uh, here, right before I went out as ambassador to Syria. And Ambassador Jerigian uh, convened a symposium on Syria. Um, he was present, of course, as a former ambassador to Syria uh, Richard Murphy, another former ambassador to Syria, also a former assistant secretary, was here as well. And uh, as you put it at the time, uh, you were going to tell me everything I needed to know uh, <laughs> to be a successful ambassador to Syria. Uh, you may recall that uh, not too long after that, we had the singular failure of the uh, Syrian-Israeli negotiations uh, for a peace agreement on the Golan Heights. So uh, once again, I'm back, and good luck with the future of Iraq. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, um, well, let, let me echo a few of the themes that Ambassador Necrobanti laid out, uh, but uh, let me start again with the the issue of the relationship between diplomacy and military action and presence um, uh, between the civilian sector and the military sector, because it cannot be an either or, a black or white, an us or them, um, a one or the other. Uh, these efforts have to move in total coordination. Um, um, and, and that is something that uh, General Petraeus and I both seized on before either of us set foot in Iraq for our tours uh, in the 07, 08, 09 period. Uh, and that was a, a, a page we took from uh, the chapter you wrote with, uh, with uh, General Casey. We were, we were on the phone to each other. He was at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Um, I was ambassador to Pakistan. And we burned up a lot of the government's um, uh, non-extendable minutes on secure phone calls uh, back and forth, figuring out, uh, uh, you know, how we were going to coordinate. Uh, this was the end of 06, um, uh, the very worst of times in Iraq. Uh, we had no idea whether the administration's new policy, the new way forward in Iraq, popularly known as the surge, was going to work. Uh, uh, but we did know that without the closest possible coordination between us, it would fail. Um, uh, so e even before I was in Baghdad, uh, I had a team in Baghdad, and General Petraeus had a team in Baghdad, uh, chaired by uh, officers representing uh, both of us. Um, uh, and that team spent uh, six weeks on the ground assessing where the situation was and where we could jointly hope to take it. Uh, it's called the Joint Strategic Assessment Team, and it produced something called the Joint Campaign Plan that um, uh, guided our efforts, periodically revised the whole time we were there. Um, there is an adage in the military that I have uh, come to embrace. The plan may be nothing, but the planning is everything. Uh, the, uh, the act of planning, of, of bringing civilians and military, uh, foreign service uh, and serving officers together in the same room to go through it top to bottom exhaustively, uh, to challenge each other's assumptions uh, to produce a plan that uh, uh, General Petraeus and I would subsequently sign and then track its implementation. Uh, 
um, uh, was for us key in ensuring that we had uh, a common effort, if not a common chain of command. Because the reality is, uh, in the post-Cold War world, uh, there really are no longer any purely military contingencies, where you just send the forces forward uh, uh, and let them do what they're trained to do in a kinetic sense, um, and there is no a diplomatic component. Those days do not exist. If they ever did, they certainly do not exist now. Um, uh, uh, similarly, in an in increasing number of situations, contingency situations, certainly Iraq, Afghanistan, but many others, uh, uh, there really aren't purely diplomatic challenges. They're informed by military considerations and often military presence. So the ability of uh, the civilian services and the military services to work together is, in my view, going forward, absolutely critical uh, uh, to the defense of American interests, whether it's Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, or the contingencies yet to come that certainly will come. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to see my uh, old friend and colleague, um, um, General Ivany, uh, uh, here today, now President Ivany. Uh, uh, we were together in Kuwait as we worked out back in the, um, the mid-1990s just how you had a combined diplomatic military approach to the challenges that Saddam was sending south. So it's not new, it's, uh, uh, but it has been brought to an apogee in, um, in the case of these very complex contingencies. Um, uh, and that, that would take me to one of uh, John Negroponte's points that I think is, is worth re-emphasizing. We are not a nation at war. Um, uh, we have not been a nation at war uh, uh, after 9-11, certainly not uh, after March 2003 when our forces crossed the line of departure into Iraq. We are not a nation at war today. Um, but beyond that, we're not really a government at war. Um, uh, we are a military at war. Uh, we're largely a foreign service at war. John Negroponte, as Deputy Secretary, saw to that. Um, but we're not a government at war. Um, there are no mechanisms uh, to compel and to coordinate the civilian uh, component of a response to a complex contingency. Uh, uh, what I found as ambassador to Iraq, as we expanded our civilian presence considerably, um, was that I had to beg and plead with different agencies in Washington, uh, speaking directly in some cases to cabinet heads uh, who were dealing with their own mandates, uh, their own resource constraints, uh, their own challenges on domestic agendas. Uh, uh, but uh, I would be concerned for our capacity to sustain the challenges in Iraq, build up to them in Afghanistan without a more coherent mechanism uh, to ensure that uh, whether we call it a war or not, when we are facing large complex contingencies, there is a structure, a mechanism uh, that ensures that the civilian effort is adequately and rationally resourced uh, without the ambassador on the spot um, having to uh, go through the uh, electronic Rolodex and make all the calls uh, himself or herself. Um, um, let me just uh, talk uh, briefly because we were enjoined to be brief and thus far we haven't. Um, um, uh, Iraq is by uh, deduction from that is not a normal diplomatic operating environment. It will not be for some time to come. It should not be. And I'm a little bit concerned by um, uh, a certain trend of thought that says, okay, uh, forces are drawing down. We should go back to kind of a normal civilian approach to conducting a, um, a bilateral relationship. 
Well, we may get there some someday. I, I, I find your estimate from 2005 of five years to be breathtakingly to short. <laughs> but, but now it seems. Uh, uh, but that is not where we are now, uh, and. Um, uh, I think any tendency in government to say, okay, this was an aberration, maybe we had to do it for a short while once, um, but we shouldn't do that as the norm, well, this may be the new norm. Um, uh, even in terms of civilian presence, we've got um, provincial reconstruction teams uh, throughout the country. At high tide, we had 27 of them. Uh, we're below that now. But we should be very, very careful about drawing them down too fast. Uh, we need to be creative in ways we secure them. Uh, but clearly, to be effective diplomatically and developmentally, a presence outside of Baghdad uh, for the foreseeable future is going to be important. Uh, I cannot agree more with um, uh, Ambassador Negropani's comment about, again, the long haul. Uh, these processes take a long time, and uh, no amount of good ideas generated from Washington um, uh, can be dispatched by FedEx to Iraq and laid down on that template and made to work. Uh, these things have to be chipped out uh, in their own context, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, uh, in their own way. We can assist, prod, cajole, nudge, threaten, uh, but, and that's all diplomacy. Uh, uh, the, the, the threatening part is often the most fun. It's a, <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, but they have to do it, and, and they have to do it in their own way and in their own terms. Um, uh, so, uh, and a, an example of this, I, you know, I, there were several things that neither General Petraeus nor I talked about uh, in congressional testimony or outside. We did not talk about victory and we did not talk about turning points. But a very significant moment in Iraq came when Prime Minister al-Maliki ordered his forces into action uh, in the spring of 2008 against Iranian-backed extremist Shia militias in Basra and in Sadr City. Um, uh, we had told him, like he needed to hear it from us, that there was a problem with militias. Uh, hard to be a government if militias are controlling your second largest city and a huge chunk of your capital. Uh, he kind of got that. Uh, uh, talked to us about operations um, to take on these militias, but while we were still planning the plan, uh, he was suddenly committed. Um, and we spent a very tense uh, week or so not at all sure how the battle would turn in Basra uh, for him or against him and quite concerned uh, that he had just moved out too darn quick. Uh, General Petraeus made some uh, decisions, deployed some enablers, some advisors, uh, made a crucial difference, but it was Maliki's sense that politically the time was right. Um, that materially he had the force necessary to do the job, um, perhaps not in a very pretty way, but he felt he could get it done and this was the time to do it. We would have counseled more caution. Um, uh, we did provide, I think, the tipping element of enablers for him to get the job done, uh, but it was his decision and it has dramatically and positively affected the train of events in Iraq ever since. So Iraqis have to figure this out in their own way. Um, uh, our role is uh, assisting and uh, enabling, prodding, conjoling, and yes, threatening. Um, uh, a word on transition, because we are in transition, and the agreements that Ambassador Negropani mentioned, the security agreement, uh, but I think more significantly over the long run, the strategic framework agreement that we negotiated at the end of 2008 uh, set the stage for the future. These are diplomatic agreements uh, negotiated by diplomats, including the security agreement. The military had a lawyer present for those talks. Otherwise, they stayed out of it because, again, uh, 
um, that's what diplomats do. Um, and certainly our commanders in the field understood that. Their support for the process and for the agreements was absolutely critical. Uh, uh, but this was something done, again, by civilian negotiators. And I, I think that's a, that's a key understanding of, again, how, how the two elements mesh together. Some things they do in the lead with us in support, some things we lead on uh, with them in support. And the negotiation of these agreements was uh, a, uh, a civilian lead. The Strategic Framework Agreement orders our relationship with Iraq in all non-kinetic uh, matters. And I've been very pleased to see the continuity between administrations, with the Obama administration embracing both agreements. Uh, last month in Washington, there was a conference on trade and investment with Iraq. The Prime Minister of Iraq was there, his second visit in three months. Uh, might not seem exceptional to you, if you don't look at the backdrop of the modern history of the U.S. with Iraq, 50 years of estrangement, hostility, and an adversarial relationship in every aspect, you now have a, a leadership in Iraq uh, trying to promote a radically different relationship uh, uh, in, again, non-military realms. Uh, this will take continued engagement and continued commitment, and I hope that uh, the American government and people do recognize that. Uh, the consequences are immense. If Iraq orients itself toward the international community instead of away from it, um, we have an entirely different dynamic at the core of the Middle East than we have seen since 1958. But it will take time, it will take the investment of resources, it will take civilian capacity increasingly, um, and it will take that long-term commitment. Um, I think at some point we'll talk about the uh, regional and international dimensions of diplomacy. Um, um, my final point, just to underscore it, uh, uh, what you have sitting before you tonight are, are not policy wonks. Well, you're kind of a policy <laughs> wonk. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're the guys in the field. Um, uh, uh, all of us have served uh, in Iraq. Um, all of us have served in a variety of other hard places at hard times over a lot of years. And um, uh, have, have been involved in critical stakes issues uh, in the smoke and dust, sometimes literally of battle, um, when there is no time to consult the learned experts. Um, uh, when there is no capacity to call up that scholarly article uh, in a journal of consequence, uh, when there is no time really even to think of these issues overnight, um, um, and there is no time to even get a good night's sleep that overnight, just like the good night's sleep you have missed for the last month and a half because you're in the fight. Um, uh, these things may look easy and obvious um, if you're sitting outside, but um, I think I can speak for all of us. Uh, when you're there in the fight and have to figure out at the moment um, uh, what the way forward is uh, to achieve, if, if not to achieve some degree of success, at least to avert disaster, um, it, it's harder than it might look. So um, again, I, I thank uh, Ambassador Jerigian for uh, bringing in, you know, the dirty, dusty, smelly guys from the field, and uh, and you, you you clean up pretty nice. You both do. <laughs> Before we turn over to uh, broad questions from the audience, I want to try to tease out just a couple of specific issues that confronted both of you in different ways and at different times. One, on a very broad level, is that one frequently hears in various forms, especially in Washington, where we're all about policy, except when we're doing career destruction and gossip briefly, that, uh, that one has to get the Iraqis, uh, we have to have leverage, we have to use leverage to compel or to urge the Iraqi government to govern as a government of all Iraqis, to come together, to form unity, 
Um, in other words, to just generally play other than as Iraqis. And I wanted to ask each of you just to reflect for a couple of minutes on what are the tools we have in pursuing those kind of ends, and what are the limitations that one that each of you faced in terms of what was the realm of the possible? Uh, it's a tough, tough question. And, and when I heard Ryan talking about the threats, of course, um, there are limits to that too, aren't they? Because of the the overall commitment we have to the relationship with, with the country of, of Iraq. I, I personally, now this is a matter of, uh, I mean, each of us have had our experiences, but I personally tend to downplay in my own, own mind how much immediate leverage we have as a consequence of the importance of any given bilateral relationship, because that's sort of there, the importance of the relationship. And uh, how do you influence somebody else to do, um, to uh, take decisions and to steer things in a direction that you would like to see them go? I, I Frankly, I think a lot of it has to do with establishing effective relationships. I'd say, I bet every one of us has done the same thing in terms of how we treated those first months at our various diplomatic postings. We went and called on and met and got to know as many people in leadership positions as we possibly could. We established personal relations we, so that um, when we needed them at some later point in time, it wasn't the first time we called on them for, for, uh, for help. And so uh, I would say uh, diplomacy, there is a really strong element of personal engagement. Now, to me, the rapport that I had with Prime Minister Alawi, he was the prime minister when I was uh, in, in Iraq, was extremely important. And we had set up a kind of a mechanism whereby we were able to interact on an almost constant basis, starting with the fact that we had once uh, once a week, he and I and General Casey had a dinner together. And, you know, so that if nothing else, we could be assured that at least we had this one uh, time for several hours uh, each week, not to mention inevitably we would have more meetings uh, in the intervening uh, six or seven days. But so I, I do think personal rapport and so forth. But, um, you know, when, when you're uh, particularly in a wartime situation, uh, leverage uh, in the in its rawest form, I have always found is a slightly difficult thing to invoke. And if you do do it, and somehow it misfires on you, you can uh, make a terrible mess out of a out of the bilateral relationship. So that's my my reaction to that question. Uh, I, I I would endorse uh, exactly that. Um, Influence is built up over time and on the basis of relationships. Um, your influence increases enormously uh, if you're dealing with people who, uh, who have some, uh, some trust and confidence in you. Um, at a minimum, it means they're going to take what you say seriously. Uh, uh, Language is important. Uh, all of us here, Ambassador Georgian, all of us speak fluently uh, one or more foreign languages. Um, uh, you, you cannot do effective diplomacy without it. Uh, if you have to have a translator in that room uh, for that, that, that critical no-nonsense discussion, uh, it becomes far more difficult and can be that turning point between uh, success uh, and failure. Uh, Can I interject that that was a disadvantage that I had in Iraq because I didn't speak Arabic. But and it was the spoke first, English. He spoke English. But it was the first post I'd ever had in the Foreign Service where I could not speak directly to my counterparts. And so that was a disadvantage. Um, uh, you have to understand the context in which you're dealing. If you don't understand their history, not just their history, but their view of their history, uh, you kind of lose credibility too. Uh, uh, if, you, if you don't understand what they've been through or what at least their narrative is of what they've been through, uh, 
they will discount uh, what you might be trying to tell them. And I'll just give you one case in point. Uh, uh, by the time I left, we had um, seen some singularly positive developments with the a virtual disappearance of sectarian violence between Sunni and Shia Arabs in Iraq. Uh, but as that subsided, there was a growing uh, ethnic tension between Kurds and Arabs, both Sunni and Shia, uh, that several times uh, approached the point of violence uh, during my last months there. And uh, I would have conversations with Kurdish leaders who were up in arms. We are not going to let the Arabs do to us what they did before. By God, we'll fight and die, and so forth and so on. I'd say, well, you know, I know a little bit of your history. What were the very worst of times for Iraq's Kurds? And that would normally get a lively debate going. Um, some would say the onfall campaign of the 1980s, uh, late 80s, when Saddam used poison gas. Others would say 1990. Uh, with the, uh, the Kurdish rising in the aftermath of Desert Storm. Uh, but when I asked the opposite question, what are the best of times, there was no debate. Today, now, right <laughs> now. I mean, this is as good as it has ever been. Uh, uh, we've got a regional government of our own. Um, uh, we have 17% of national oil revenues uh, to, to fund our budgets. Uh, this is as good as it gets. And then my follow-on point would be, right, don't blow it. Um, uh, and, and similarly to the federal government, uh, uh, incensed by Kurdish provocations and overreach as they saw it, to say, you have just come through absolute hell uh, when no one thought you could, and yet you've hung together, you've withstood uh, regional pressures, uh, you have overcome internal violence, um, uh, you are poised for a progression that no one thought possible. Don't blow it. Um, and to a certain extent, this may seem intuitively obvious, but in this context, it is often critical to have an outside player of significance just put that up in front of the players. That um, It's kind of like the old joke. Um, I'm going to kill him, hold my coat while I kill him, hold me back. Don't hold my coat, hold me back, otherwise I'm just going to kill him. Please hold me back. <laughs> uh, there, there is something of that in confrontational diplomacy as well, and it's kind of knowing um, uh, who you're dealing with, what their background and perspectives are because of their history, uh, to have that rapport uh, where you can simply say some otherwise blindingly obvious truths and have everybody calm down. And you just, again, you deal with this day to day, month to month, crisis to crisis, and it takes a long time. Uh, the Iraq story, post-2003, this is still chapter one, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and we've probably got 37 more chapters in front of us. It's going to be a very long book. I'm, I'm really struck thinking about what you both said by how difficult it is to get people to understand the nature of personal suasion in diplomacy. I think the whole context of a media culture and Hollywood movies where conversations are so short that people generally don't finish their drink uh, leads one to have a, a very strange view of how one goes in. And, and then we have this view of threat that, you know, tell them to do something or else. I sometimes think of that old comedy of Blazing Saddles where the sheriff threatens to shoot himself if he's not allowed to go out. You know, it barely works in a bad slapstick comedy. Uh, you both have touched on the Kurdish issue, and it's one that I wanted to get back to a little bit. That was always a tenuous piece of the relationship. It was difficult. Uh, under Bremer when I was there first when they were negotiating the uh, transitional agreements. In the end, they kicked that element largely down the road when we had the most leverage. It continues to resurface. Right now, we're waiting for the Iraqi parliament to resolve issues that are critical to having an election early next year, and the issue of Kirkuk 
and behind it the larger Kurdish differences are one of the things again threatening unity. And I wondered if each of you would reflect for a minute. Do you think there were moments where we could have done more? Or had we already essentially periodically lost the leverage to do more? And as one confronts the situation now, strategic framework agreement, changes in our policy, our forces are going to be leaving. How do you see our ability to contain that friction going forward? I guess what I would say is two things. One, to the point that Ryan made, which was that the Kurds really had it pretty good by having their own autonomous area. And it was, I mean, the contrast between Iraqi Kurdistan and the rest of the country in terms of the standard of living, the degree of security, and everything else is, is truly amazing. I mean, uh, we all loved going up to Kurdistan. It was kind of like a, you'd heave a sigh of relief when you got there. And it was like a breath of fresh air. So they, they better be careful not to blow it because uh, it's in their interest not to uh, seriously antagonize the rest of the country because uh, they don't have that many friends in the neighborhood. They're, they're surrounded by people who don't necessarily wish them that well, whether it's Iran or Turkey or or Syria. So I think they, they do well themselves to pay some attention to what it takes to maintain a, a decent sort of equilibrium in their relationship with, with Baghdad. Um, I think the problem in terms of trying to find some negotiated outcome to Kirkuk and the other issues between the Kurds and and the uh, Arab parts of uh, of Iraq during the time I was there, at least, was that the government was simply not strong enough to have that kind of a negotiation. Um, whether and, and and so I think that was an issue. Whether it will become or is now strong enough or will become that. Uh, remains to be seen. But I mean, that was the issue. So I think we just worked more on the basis of just trying to buy time and keep things from getting too explosive. Yeah, and that's uh, that's another great lesson I've learned over the years. Uh, buying time is almost always a really excellent investment. <laughs> uh, uh, and it is certainly an excellent investment in Iraq. Uh, it's just what I said. This is chapter one. Um, I still recall when I was getting ready for another anodyne ambassadorial Fourth of July speech in um, uh, 2008, one of the brighter members of my staff um, uh, uh, said to me, he said, look, uh, there's some interesting math here. If you date the creation of the modern Iraqi state to the uh, establishment of the monarchy in 1921, um, and you add 87 years, it's today, 2008. Um, uh, if you add 87 years to 1776 and the Declaration of Independence, it's the day after the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, so we didn't get it all worked out uh, in our own society and our own republic um, uh, nine decades later after the most costly war we've ever fought against each other uh, we at least determined the course we were on um, many of the arguments now underway in Iraq including of uh, a critical part of the Kurdish Arab debate is a state's rights issue. What are the authorities and prerogatives of a regional government in the north vis-a-vis -a, -vis a federal government? And to add another layer of complication, uh, uh, how about that federal government versus provincial governments? Uh, uh, now, I think the Iraqis are going to be in a position to track this a little faster than we did with less violence, uh, one would hope. But these are hard issues. And to think that you can solve them on a contemporary American timeline is not just hallucinatory, it is positively dangerous. Uh, so, you know, look, we kicked Kirkuk down the road uh, uh, about a year ago when we worked with the Iraqis to get the provincial elections law passed uh, because it was too hard to do. Um, well, guess what? It's a year later, 
It's now the national election law, and it's still too hard to do. And the only way they're going to find a way forward is to kick the Kirkuk can down the road again. You can't fix it now. And, and bear in mind that Kirkuk isn't just uh, about a bunch of Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmen who can't seem to get along. Uh, uh, it is the result of uh, Saddam Hussein's political engineering and displacement of populations over several decades uh, that has led to the grievances that they're now confronted with. Um, so um, long-term, chip away at it slowly, and wherever you can get a buy, get a delay, kick it down to the next ambassador. Good luck, <laughs> Ambassador Hill. <laughs> I, I don't see why he can't deal with it. I worked it out by leaving it to my successor. It's a, uh, that, 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 that's how it has to work in a real world. Well, I was terribly tempted to ask you one more question about the utility of economic assistance as leverage, but I think we better, <laughs> we, but we better, we better let the audience have a crack at this. So let's open this up and take your questions, ma'am. Yes, hi. I would like, um, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. But I wanted to see if Dr. Um, Ambassador Mahanti would expand on you were saying that you felt like that we should have let the sanctions take their course prior to um, going to war with Iraq. You said the decision had already been made. Can you kind of expand on when that decision was made? Yeah. Please. Uh, <laughs> hey, by the way, can everybody hear the question? The, the question was, here, I'll repeat it. The question was uh, that I'd said I thought inspections ought to be allowed to uh, uh, play out a little bit longer, uh, but that I felt that the decision had already been made to go into Iraq. Look, I'm the, that I, I was not involved in I, at the UN. I was not a member of the cabinet. Some UN ambassadors are, and I was not involved in the deliberations to go into Iraq. But from everything I've uh, read subsequently, um, my sense is that the decision had, in fact, been made to go in. If you just look at the way we built up the forces. Uh, beforehand, it's pretty obvious uh, that we were going to go in there. My 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 point about the inspections is that I don't think four months is enough time to allow any diplomatic strategy to work, and that's effectively we passed that resolution 1441 in <coughs> November. Well, just to get a credible inspection regime going is going to take four to six months. Oh, there were many resolutions they ignored, but the, the point was that the inspection process had effectively been suspended, and uh, this uh, resolution basically reinstated the inspections re and, and uh, sort of mobilized a major inspection initiative, and, it was, the, and the, it was to get the inspectors back into Iraq. My only point is that you got to make the case. The, the point is to bring along the rest of the international community. And I think if you'd allowed uh, that process, let's say, to go for a year, and then if uh, Iraq was not um, cooperating, or if, in fact, we found WMD, don't forget, we, at that time we expected to find WMD, then we would have had a, probably a better foundation for action. I'm just focusing on the issue of legitimacy and the fact that rightly or wrongly, whether it was right or wrong to go into Iraq, we, we didn't go in with international support. And that has hurt us over the long run. There's no question about it in my mind that it hurt us. If I could just add two points to that. Um, as Ambassador Agrippani was saying, we, we had long lost the inspections. When we bombed Iraq in 98, time when I was a deputy assistant secretary in city. We had had a plan to bomb for a diplomatic purpose, and we had a lot of support. We then called off the bombing at the last minute. We then decided a month later that, surprise, surprise, we hadn't gotten any, things, any of the things we'd asked for, and we then elected to bomb because we'd said we would if we didn't get what we wanted. And this was the Clinton administration. At that point, we had no diplomatic strategy, and we basically designed the bombing. We, the, the administration basically designed a bombing goals which they felt they could uh, claim success on in a few days of bombing, not 
ones which had any actual substance. And, and one of the things they elected was to accept writing off the inspection regime, which I don't think was necessary, but that was the decision. On the timetable, I was ambassador in Bahrain when we were getting ready to go to war. We were watching the troop build up. We were all, all the ambassadors in the Gulf were busy uh, getting local governments to agree to establish various uh, support facilities, troops coming in, planes being based. And we were all very aware that we were coming up on the summer in the Gulf, which is brutally hot, which is the worst possible time for military operations. So that what we were watching without anybody telling us was something a little bit akin to the mobilization schedules of World War I that once you began this process, it was extraordinarily difficult to find a way out of it. And you were already on a timetable, which I think represented a decision, but which also itself, because of the weather and because of logistics, became a, a compelling pressure not to delay. Let's see, gentlemen here. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to ask Hey, you have to, make, you have to be more specific. Uh, <laughs> to, to our panel entirety, then. I'd like to ask your effect, uh, your view on the effect of uh, indiscriminate terrorist bombing attacks on the civilian population. And I'm curious whether they, number one, enhance the support of the government against those doing the bombing, whether or not they create additional differences between the parties and create those those aspects of those viewpoints, or whether they weaken the government because the government is ineffective in trying to stop them. What What is your feeling on that and, and how it maybe falls over and what's going on in Afghanistan and in Pakistan? You want to start from the time you were there and I can yeah, well, I mean, I think, and going all the way back to my experience in Vietnam, I think you, uh, the key question you, you, is the answer is embodied in your question where you talked about the government's ability to deal with it. I think uh, uh, if a, terrorism, a terrorist act simply highlights the inability of the government to protect the people, it, it, it could actually weaken the government and support for it. I mean, people, what people want is security. And uh, these random acts uh, are, you know, gruesome reminders of the fact that they're, they're wherever they happen to live is, is insecure. So, um, but it can have a whole variety of effects, I suppose, if it mobilizes, uh, if the reaction to it is to mobilize people to take some effective action, uh, you know, all well and good. But, but for that, you have to have good governance and you have to have a, a, capa a capacity to respond. So I would say it, it will very much depend on the circumstances uh, under which the particular terrorist act takes place. Uh, well, in, in, we've all lived with terrorism a good part of our careers. Uh, the war on terror started for me uh, personally when the embassy in Beirut blew up with me in it in April of 1983. Um, uh, it is, terror is a tactic. Um, uh, it, it isn't a strategy, it's not an ideology. Uh, and we often call it mindless or cowardly. Uh, in many cases, it's neither. Uh, it's carefully targeted and intended. And in Iraq, we have seen an evolution of uh, terror, which comes from many sources. I'll just focus on al-Qaeda, because I think that's, uh, those are the bombings you're focused on. Uh, uh, in the 06-07 uh, period and into 08, well into 08, uh, al-Qaeda was fueling the sectarian conflict, uh, which had reached the point of civil war. Uh, uh, and it was working for them. Uh, when Sunnis in Iraq started to take a stand against al-Qaeda be, uh, because of al-Qaeda's excesses and because we had their back through the surge, that changed the dynamic entirely. Um, they kept going with the attacks, uh, but the attacks no longer had the effect of fueling sectarian violence. Um, they tried and they tried again. They were equal opportunity killers. They set off bombs in Sunni areas and Shia areas against Turkmen, against Kurds, but with an increasingly diminishing impact. It just wasn't working. The Iraqis had had it with that kind of violence. So they shifted targets. Uh, 
What have we seen since, uh, since the summer? Uh, uh, bomb attacks continue, uh, not with a great frequency, but with devastating consequence. <coughs> They're directed against the government. Um, the, the, the target now, I think very clearly is, as Ambassador Negroponte suggested, uh, to show the government as being weak, ineffective, unable to govern. Um, so that's, that's the target now. Um, uh, the sectarian thing worked for them for a while, it stopped working, so they shifted targeting. Uh, uh, and now it is a huge challenge for the Iraqi government and for us in support of them, and it, the military is not the instrument for this, uh, to continue to take apart those, uh, those al-Qaeda cells, because this is a determined, resilient enemy that as long as he has the wherewithal, um, um, uh, he will put it together for the targeting he thinks is going to do the most damage. Shifted from population to government insta symbols, uh, that's where he is now. I would just add that there's a number of variables. Initial terrorist attacks, a few, can provoke outrage. But when people feel completely menaced, then nothing else counts except security, Ambassador Negroponte's point. Uh, at that point, they have to think, in order to get a, a reaction that is to get a mobilization, they have to see this as a viable chance. The combination of the surge and the Sunni reaction produced circumstances that allowed people to see a, vi a, a viable opportunity. Some of that reaction in the Sunni community had existed a year and even two years before, but they didn't see a viable way out. The same issue in a general sense is happening in Afghanistan. I think this is what makes the issue of protection of the population an absolutely correct dimension of the policy that President Obama, well, policy, the goals President Obama announced in March, whether that's still the policy, we'll find out. Um, if people feel that they can be menaced, they don't take a lot of risks. They have to believe they, it's one thing to be brave, but it's another, it's another thing to be suicidal. Uh, not suicidal attackers, but people feeling that they're being asked to take suicidal chances to support a government. Without an ability of the government or the forces in various configurations to provide support, to provide enough support that people can rally around and feel they've got something that's, that they can win with. You cannot expect de development, efficiency, governance, or anything else to have much traction. You, you, know, you really can't worry too much about loyalty if you're dead. Um, and from that, you every situation is different, but you there's a certain iron logic that follows if you're going to do population security. That is, you have to have certain density of forces. You have to have certain numbers of local forces because you can't do it without it. It's not a doctrine you can preach in a vacuum. And I think this is a critical element of what we're facing right now in Afghanistan. Let's see, we haven't had one on this side of the room. Um, well, was, uh, there's three hands, and I don't know. Why don't we get all three and we'll try to do a scattershot answer? We're starting, we'll work up, and, sir. Short questions, we'll see if we can then do short answers. <laughs> Uh, my, my question is around the reasonableness of uh, the expectation of democracy in the Middle East. Uh, I think we have certain biases toward it in this country and, and Western countries, but the culture in the Middle East being so different than tribal uh, cultures, uh, what's the panel's view on the reasonableness of democracy for that part of the world? And, and, and if it is a solution, uh, wouldn't our closest allies, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, the better entries for democracy into that area. Um, one population or ethnic minority, really religious minority, that has not really been mentioned a lot is the Christian population in Iraq. It is a community I come from, and I'm just very sad to see what's happened to it. I, really like to know some of your views and what you saw and, and also what can be done to help sort of rebuild that community and bring some of those people who were 
basically have to flee. I guess my question refers to aid. We talk a lot about like bilateral state level aid, but I was wondering what you were thinking about the efficacy of such efforts and if maybe the U.S. should just stick with infrastructure and like microfinance efforts instead of just giving it and falling prey to corruption. Well, that gives us a minute, a minute and a half apiece. <laughs> Okay, Ryan, you get to go first yeah, then because you have to scoot. Uh, well, it, it, in uh, terms of democracy, there, uh, I think, is nothing in the genetic makeup of any peoples in the world that um, excludes them from um, uh, a pursuit of democracy. And indeed, there are, um, in the Middle East, you have the case of Lebanon, uh, riven by civil war in the, uh, for 15 years from 75 to 90, yet uh, the, the fundamental democracy of Lebanon, uh, imperfect though it may be, has survived. And it survived Israeli occupation, it survived Syrian occupation, it has survived militia warfare. Um, it, it has been part of Lebanese fabric uh, uh, through today as they struggle to make sense of the outcome of their election, their last election, and, and actually form a government. So it's, uh, it is certainly possible. Um, we'll see where democracy goes in Iraq. Um, uh, uh, there is a history, uh, again, uh, only partially developed during um, the monarchy of a parliament and of elections. Uh, Iraqis recall that and seem to me, uh, Ambassador Negroponte mentions the 05 election manifestation, rather fiercely committed to a democracy that will take its own form. Um, it isn't going to look like ours at the end of the day. I don't know what it will look like, but it will be something they do. Um, uh, uh, of, of all the things that I think the West or the U.S. cannot impose, uh, that would be on the top of my list, uh, democracy. Um, uh, you know, we certainly had our own laborious struggle as to what it would mean in this country, in this society, so it will be the case in others. Um, uh, but that is not to say that countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia have no form of... Um, uh, allowing popular opinion to be heard. They do. Um, uh, these are all kinds of informal mechanisms. Where they will go, I don't know. But the resilience of, um, of forms of governments is striking. Uh, Americans have been predicting the downfall of the House of Saud for, oh, whoa, 30, 40 years. Uh, House of Saud's doing pretty well. Uh, and they could not do pretty well, if, I think, if it was uh, uh, not based on some form of popular consensus and support. So, you know, my view is we need to kind of take a look at the world as it is um, uh, and, and see how it develops in its own terms. Uh, the plight of Christians in Iraq, uh, uh, tragic. Um, uh, we have undertaken efforts in the plains of Nineveh um, uh, on both the levels of economic assistance within the constraints of our legislation uh, to ensure that these communities at least had uh, an economic viability. Uh, we also worked uh, informally um, with the government of Iraq to see that uh, the Sons of Iraq program, if you will, uh, uh, in which uh, young men from local communities uh, carried arms in defense of those communities, so important to the Sunni awakening uh, in, in Anbar, uh, also applied in these areas where uh, uh, young men would be paid by the government, uh, to some to serve as... Um, official members of the security services, others to, to do what uh, uh, Sunni and some Shia counterparts were doing elsewhere. Uh, but again, major actions have major consequences. The intervention in Iraq was a major action, a huge action, the consequences of which cannot be foreseen at the outset. 20th, 30th, and 40th order consequences that go on for the next 36 chapters of that book. Um, and uh, uh, how this will play out for Iraq's Christians, I don't know. Um, um, but I have a deep concern. Um, the, 
the Christians have been targeted as others have. Um, Christians in many cases have other options because of their level of education and their contacts outside. And I, I, I do worry a bit uh, about the loss of critical mass in the Christian community. Um, I, I doubt. Yeah, yeah, it has. And that, um, and then um, uh, microfinance. Microfinance. Look, uh, Ambassador Negroponte's point was so relevant about uh, the uh, the hollowing out of USAID. There are fewer USAID officers today worldwide than were in Vietnam when you oh, were there. Oh, sure. Two thousand two hundred. Yeah, so it's about, yeah, it's, um, you need a robust USAID to make these kinds of calls. In some cases, uh, microfinance is the right tool, particular time, given area. In some cases, infrastructure projects make a difference. Um, um, and in some cases, they don't. But you need professional, a cadre of professional international development experts to make those recommendations, make those calls, make those judgments, and increasingly we have suffered for the, the lack thereof. Ambassador Newman, may I ask you to continue with uh, you and John, but uh, yeah. Ambassador Ryan Crocker has to leave in order to preside over this honor of this uh, ceremony tomorrow. I think, I think we're also pretty close to what we have to wrap up, but yeah. John, you want to... But I just want to, if I could add one point uh, on the assistance. Let, let's not forget, because this is a critical difference with Afghanistan. Iraq's got resources. Uh, Afghanistan does not. And uh, so in terms of uh, what we do in Iraq, I think a lot has to do with helping them build the capacity to administer their own uh, uh, resources uh, rather than providing them with a lot more. I think we pretty much, the, the 20 or so billion dollars that we gave in our assistance in our reconstruction effort was is pretty much it. And the rest has got to be more rule of law, helping, uh, you know, things that are uh, don't involve large expenditures of money, but where we can sort of target uh, certain specific areas. I think just to undergird a couple of points made by, by both Ambassador Crocker and Ambassador Negroponte, on the question of democracy, there is a basic need for governments to enjoy the support of a majority of their own people. That's a fundamental piece of legitimacy. How that is expressed has a lot of difference, but when governments lose the support of their own people or can't generate it, they lose the capacity to resist. So I think that for the time being, how that's expressed in different countries is is going to be very various. We obviously have our own, uh, our own uh, feel, feelings about it, but I think as one looks particularly at countries where the existing structure is totally destroyed, like Iraq or Afghanistan, you have very little alternative, whether you're an Iraqi, an Afghan, or an American working on policy, than to try to help construct a government that can enjoy a fairly broad measure of popular support, because without that, you cannot put together the sinews of the state in a way that can resist. I do think it is important to focus on the central point of support of the people and not get locked up in our forms of mechanisms, which we tend to jump to. And we are particularly keen on having elections, often without any underpinnings, and in some parts of the world without doing all that, without recognizing that the key task may be to sustain and expand and build the democratic institutions institutions and civic culture that have to undergird elections. But it's less a question of form than it is of support. And then simply on aid, same same answer. That there's a lot we need a lot of tools in the toolkit, but we need to be discriminating about understanding which tool. So that microcredit can be really important at a village level, but when you're talking about Afghanistan with the total destruction almost of the livestock over 25 years of war, you need larger mechanisms. Uh, Iraq has a lot of roads. Saddam built a lot of infrastructure. Uh, 
Afghanistan has almost none. If you can't move a crop to market, you don't have to worry about which crop you ought to grow as an alternative to poppy. Uh, if you can't have enough electric power to compete with Pakistan and Iran, you can't productively do any kind of agricultural processing and you can't put people to work. So the challenges are going to be different in different places. I think the need for a lot of decisions on the ground that comes back to implementation to people on the ground to making a lot of decisions there and not having the illusion that you can make these as large policy decisions in the United States. You can give money, you can give general direction, you can get a little relief from an overbearing federal bureaucracy that puts a lot of obstacles in the way of speed. Uh, but, but at the end, these are not ultimately things to be resolved by policy. Now, I lost Ambassador Derigian saying farewell, but how about, our, one, last question? How about one last question? Since, since he hasn't told us we're leaving, um, <laughs> you know, we'll take one. Like, John, Remember you pick schedule. it. Well, okay. What about the way in the back there? Yeah. Um, are there any lessons learned in Iraq that can be applied in Afghanistan, or is that kind of a fallacy that I mean, you see, you read a lot in the debates going on in the newspapers or on the TV screens about, you know, obviously this issue of troop increases, maybe a surge like effort now. Yeah, are there lessons learned in Iraq that can apply to Afghanistan? Well, you know, it is really quite interesting how we can kind of. My view about these conflicts is that we tend to usually take several years before we figure out um, exactly what the best way to go about it is. And I think that was true in Iraq. It was true in Vietnam. But, but in Vietnam, we, when we finally figured it out, we'd lost uh, the, the, uh, the political will here in this country. People were fed up with the situation. So it is, it is quite an interesting point that we tend to reinvent the wheel every time we get into these situations. Now, they're not entirely identical, but, but sure, if you're into counterinsurgency um, strategy, uh, some of the sort of same general rules apply. And certainly one of them is, and we were, we've all been t talking about it today, is that you've got to build up some kind of effective governmental presence. And you're not going to do that if you... Uh, have an inadequate uh, security forces. Uh, Afghanistan has as much territory, as a large a territory, and as many people as the country of Iraq, and in much more difficult terrain. And yet in the eight-year period uh, since we've been engaged there, seven years, eight, um, we've only built a, up a, an army of about 70 or 80,000 people. The Iraqi army is two or three times as large. So... Uh, I think certainly one of the uh, lessons learned from uh, various of these conflicts in the past is that governmental presence matters, the ability to provide security is primordial, and uh, these are uh, fairly uh, time-tested lessons, and I think if we're going to be uh, at all uh, even moderately successful in Afghanistan, we're going to have to uh, take heed, pay heed to them. I would just add that one has to differentiate between learning lessons and trying to apply tactics to different situations. So the need to protect civilians, the needs that Investor Negroponte was talking about, are key in Afghanistan. The tactic of the surge, the way it was used, or the so-called ANBAR solution, which is particularly unsuitable for Afghanistan for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, difference in the situation, people have not been massively oppressed by the Taliban, they've been narrowly targeted. Uh, you don't have the same kind of tribal structure. It's the tribal structure of Afghanistan is more, more consensual and less autocratic than the tribal structure of Iraq. Lot lots and lots of differences. So one has to be very careful in taking large lessons and principles and not assuming that you can turn them into kind of soundbite wisdom and apply them in a cookie cutter fashion. And like a lot of other things, the art of implementation is in knowing the difference. And I think we have used up the time. We certainly have not used up the subject. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you, Ambassador. Have a good night.